Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your very, very long-time host on The Open Mind. Indeed, after all these years of on-the-air conversations with both the makers and the chroniclers of the American experience, I'm reminded that it was just 50 years ago this month that the much-honored grandfather of today's guest joined me here. <laughs> but it was quite an occasion then to welcome Norman Thomas six-time socialist candidate for president of the United States, and to enjoy the warmth and the wisdom of that singular American. And I suspect Norman Thomas would have found his journalist, historian, biographer, grandson, Evan Thomas' new little brown volume, The War Lovers, as compelling and as on target as I have in its tale of America's rush to empire in the late 19th century, and the roles played by Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, William Randolph Hearst, and others. I dare say Norman Thomas would have approved its thrust as well, particularly its perceptive penultimate comment about two famous American war lovers, President Theodore Roosevelt and his namesake son, that, quote, because only the dead have known the end of war, they will not be the last. But I would begin our program today by asking my journalist guest, who has long been a writer and editor at Time and Newsweek magazine, just why he ends the war of his as he does, with reference to Teddy Roosevelt's old office as America's boldly aggressive assistant secretary of the Navy, being used now as home to senior White House staff. And I quote again, in recent years, an occupant proudly hung a portrait of Roosevelt on the wall to draw inspiration from it. As J. Lewis Scooter Liberty sat at, Libby, sat at his desk, toiling for his boss, Vice President Richard Cheney, he had only to look at the wall to see the old war lover staring down at him. Now, why? Why <laughs> end it that way? What, is it, what are you telling us? Uh, I covered the Iraq war and uh, the war on terror uh, for Newsweek, and I used to go see Scooter Libby all the time. Uh, my office is about a half a block from the White House. And uh, after 9-11, when I was talking to him, he uh, pointed to Roosevelt's portrait, and he said, you know, when the planes hit the buildings uh, on 9-11, that portrait shook. And I didn't know quite how to respond to that. I wasn't quite sure if he was putting me on or being literal. And as I got to know him better, it was clear that he was being literal. He really had a kind of mystical feeling about it all. Uh, and one thing I will say about Scooter Libby, although he you know, was ultimately convicted for misleading the FBI and all that, I found him to be utterly sincere. Uh, yes, he's manipulative, but he really believed in what he was doing in a kind of messianic way. And I think he took a kind of psychic um, power from that portrait of Teddy Roosevelt. I know that sounds melodramatic and kind of hard to believe, but that's the way it seemed to me. And so being around Libby and, and writing about the Iraq war got me thinking about war fever, the phenomenon of war fever. Why is it that countries go to war, whether they need to or not? I mean, some wars, unlike my grandfather, I'm not a pacifist. Actually, he was not a pacifist in World War II. I think World War II was completely necessary. Some wars are, but some wars are wars of choice. And the Spanish-American War certainly was, as the Iraq War was. And so I decided to go back in time 
and look at the Spanish-American War as a kind of a case study in a country being swept up in war fever. And of course, if you, anybody who does that is going to come right to Teddy Roosevelt. War fever. Tell us more about that. Well, I would define war fever as a slightly irrational, or maybe totally irrational, uh, feeling that sweeps up nations at certain times. I mean, why did the country suddenly feel that it had to go to war against Spain in 1898? There wasn't any huge reason. Yes, Cuba was revolting against Spain, but they've been doing it since 1868. Uh, the Cubans probably left to their own devices would have eventually freed themselves. There was a humanitarian purpose. There was. So there was a rationale. But that's not why we did it. Now, the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. But even on that, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt, sitting in that very same office, had on his desk, the day the Maine blew up, a letter uh, suggesting that these new battleships were unsafe because the coal bunker was too close to the powder magazine could cause accidents. That's exactly what happened on the main. So Roosevelt had a pretty good re reason to believe that it was an accident, but that letter <laughs> went into the Didn't bottom see drawer. The light of never day. saw the light of day. And instead of a naval board of inquiry, found that it was a Spanish minor torpedo, a provocative Cass's belly uh, for going to war. Um, and unnecessary, uh, a manipulation of the truth. Uh, to get us to go to because because Roosevelt was looking for a provocation and because he could sense the country was ready to to go to war and and, and why well there we should there are lots there's lots to talk about I wrote a whole book about it I mean it's never one thing as you know there are a number of things it's like a storm system various fronts all collide at the same time and they produce a storm a storm of war but you know at at, at the point at which you talked about Speaker Reed and you say he missed the sense of the country. Uh, was it the sense of the country? Is that what you come away with? Or do you come away with the uh, feeling that William Randolph Hearst and Pulitzer and others, along with the war-thirsty, war-hungry Roosevelt yeah. and Lodge, did this? Do you, well, that, do that's you? a fair question. I mean, you know, in history, you're endlessly debating, was it the, 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 some inert force uh, some movement, or was it where the people, you know, the truth is usually somewhere. There, there was a kind of readiness, a willingness. There was a lot of dry kindling lying around in America in 1898. But there were a few people throwing matches uh, right and left. And you mentioned uh, William Randolph Hearst, uh, the newspaper publisher who was in love with war and did his best to get us into work, claim credit for the war. Now, he grossly exaggerated. He didn't cause the Spanish-American War, but he sure did his best to get us into it and stirred the pot as much as he could. And in the small U.S. government of 1898, we have to remember how small it was. There's no national security staff. There's no national security advisor. There are no think tanks. There, there are congressional committees, but barely. Uh, so somebody like Teddy Roosevelt, even though he's only assistant secretary of the Navy, by the force of his personality and his machinations, can make things happen. And, and they were busily plotting war over, over lunch, over double lamb chops at the Metropolitan Club. I mean, literally, uh, with... Uh, Commodore Dewey and Alfred Mahan and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. So there was this little group constantly stirring the pot. Uh, and the, the public was ready to be excited. Now, this is, there are deeper reasons for this. I don't, think, I don't think they were straining at the bit. They weren't automatically sharpening their bayonets, but they were ready to be aroused. I mean, the very fact that when McKinley, finally against his wishes, and we'll talk about this, uh, did declare war and called for 125,000 volunteers, he got a million men overnight. Uh, uh, and just to get a little deeper into this, one thing that the country was looking for a way to unite North and South. After the Civil War, Civil War was a long time ago, the country had been badly divided. War is and has always been and always will be, unfortunately, a good way to bring countries again, together against a common enemy. And it did have that effect. And people were looking for a way to, to come together north and south. So that was a factor. How do you explain the fact that your alma mater, Harvard, played such yeah. an incredible role in supplying all of sure these uh, bloodthirsty... Uh... It, it sure did. Well, that goes to, I think, the deeper reason, uh, the real reason, to me, the real reason for all this. The scholarship at Harvard and Yale in that era was uh, the most popular scholarship centered around social Darwinism. 
this idea of the survival of the fittest. Darwin gave us the idea of the survival of the fittest. And this was adulterated uh, by various scholars into this belief that some races are more fit than others. And here's a shock. The most fit race is the Anglo-Saxon race. Uh, they use the word race very loosely in the 1880s and 1890s, and they had kind of mythical and, to us, preposterous notions of race. But they, this was the scholarship. This was science, or what passed for science. Uh, if, you, if you were a student at Harvard College in the 1880s, this is what you were learning. And so you were getting the steady dose that there was this great Anglo-Saxon race, and it was destined to conquer, to succeed, to rule the world, to overall all the other races. But, and here's the but, there was at the same time this feeling of weakness and lassitude, particularly in the upper classes. The very people who were supposed to be leading the charge were having headaches and stomach aches, and the women were having vapors, and these neurotic young men, the word, the word of, of that era was neurasthenia. Neurasthenia was a broad definition encompassing a host of maladies, psychosomatic maladies. Today we would call it neurotic, but then it was called neurasthenic. All these neurasthenic young men were looking for a way to reconcile their sense of their destiny, but their own feelings of inadequacy. And Roosevelt was particularly leading the charge here, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, he would talk about how that America was over-civilized, uh, that we'd grown soft, that all the great, as he put it in a famous speech in 1897, all the great masterful races have known the supreme triumphs of war that that is the, the great way countries mobilize themselves and overcome their weakness and come together. And he had another expression which is uh, evocative. He would talk about the wolf rising in the heart, that we need to find the wolf rising in the heart, these kind of primitive atavistic feelings that make a race great. And that had been lost or suppressed or repressed, and what better way to evoke it than war? Now this all sounds kind of, by our modern lights, a bit over the top, but they didn't hide the ball. This was their very uh, clearly expressed. This was, I'm not in, reading into the record here. <laughs> if anything, I'm toning it down. Uh, they were very explicit about it. And this, to go back to your question, the scholars, the center of this scholarship really was Harvard and Yale. That's because that, that's where, I mean, for instance, the first ever Harvard PhD, and I think the third PhD in the United States, I think this is right, was Henry Cabot Lodge in something called Teutonic Studies. What's that about? They had this theory that democracy was born in the Teutonic woods in ancient Germany. Complete gibberish. But that was this, the great scholarship of the time, this idea that our ideas of the rule of law and all came, Anglo-Saxon rule of law, all came from the misty past of, of Germany. Well, I mean, maybe a tiny little bit possibly with along with the other things, but that was the scholarship of the day. You find a counterpart today did, uh, talking about evocative. Uh, well, I mean, certainly there are parallels to the Iraq War. Um, is that what that last paragraph in the book means? Yes, sure. I mean, I, I wrote this book because of the Iraq War. I'm covering, writing about the Iraq War for Newsweek, and I'm, I, and I, it gets me interested in this general subject. But you write that you were sort of pro to begin with, 5149. Absolutely. I was pro. I was a hawk. Uh, I was a 5149 hawk because that's the way I am, but I was a hawk. And one thing that uh, this is, I felt at Newsweek in the winter of 2003 an atavistic feeling. Your friends at Harvard. Right. I, fe I felt it that even among my anti-war friends, even the ones who certainly had been anti-war, I'm Vietnam generation, class of 1973 at Harvard. My draft number was 356. So I, I was around, but I kind of missed the real crunch. Uh, the classes that came before me would be more exposed. But I was around. And when I was a freshman, you know, Kent State and all that. So most of my friends, my peers, are, were anti-war from that period. And some of them even were anti-war, or said they were about Iraq. But in journalism, the great bias is for conflict. I don't, I don't, you know, people talk about our bias for the left and our bias for the right. You know, there is some of all that. But our biggest bias is for conflict. And what's the biggest conflict? War. War is. And there's no question that in the 
at Newsweek in the offices of Newsweek in the in the winter of 2003, you could feel this kind of rising excitement and anticipation about going to war, even amongst the people who said they were against war. Uh, that wasn't me. I was on the I was on the hawk side of the ledger, but I could feel this, and I think that I've always believed, and I wrote it at the time, that the reason why we went to war in Iraq was not WMD. It was not geostrategic stuff. It wasn't. It wasn't. Even Saddam, it was because, and I'm going to be a, tiny, a little bit crude here, because we wanted to kick some ass. Uh, it was an atavistic feeling. We'd been hit by 9-11, uh, and there was a feeling, particularly if you lived in, if you lived in New York or Washington, that we wanted to show the world, teach them a lesson. Tom Friedman has written about this a lot, and I think kind of bravely and well that uh, the, what was really driving the Bush administration was not geostrategy or WMD. It was, it was this. It was this to, to show the world, don't, as George Bush would say, don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with the United States. And there was this kind of desire for revenge to yeah, strike but, back. But you were just talking about journalists, not talking about George Bush. Well, I certainly think it's true of George Bush, and this has been written about. Okay. It. Okay. I, I, what I'm, I'm focusing on journalists because journalists don't like to admit it. I mean, I think that uh, not a whole lot of journalists like to go back and say, yeah, we really had this kind of uncomfortable desire to go to war in, in 2003. But look at the, the, the laundry list of people who did, who were hawks, who, who this is not talked about much, but Bill Keller, editor of the New York Times, hawk. David Remnick, editor of the New Yorker, hawk. Uh, my boss, Donald Graham, publisher of the Washington Post, hawk. You know, it's a pretty big lineup of people, and people have sort of forgotten that because the press turned against the war for a lot of reasons. And you're saying it's, it's a natural because headlines come from conflict, and the biggest conflict is That's, war? It, I know you're, you, you sound astonished because it seems so ugly and kind of brutal and thoughtless and heedless. No, do you think I find journalism uh, immune from <laughs> no. all of those? No, no, I don't. But, I, I, but that's the point. They're not, and they, even though we don't readily admit it, I could, I'm just saying that I could feel it, and I could feel it amongst my peers and my rivals and my colleagues. Not necessarily expressed, maybe not even conscious, but there. Do you think that Hearst, you say, he didn't, he said, you supply the pictures, I'll supply the war, but you're not claiming he had that kind of power, but he did do an awful lot. We well, sure did. I mean, and and he had he had reach. He had people read his paper. I mean, there was no CNN, there was no PBS, there was no Fox, there was no you know there was the newspapers were it, and they were widely reprinted, and shared around the country, and his constant hammering on the drum of war did have an impact. Uh, McKinley, I think, disdained. A lot of people said they disdained the yellow journalism, but they still paid attention to it. I mean, the, the analog today would be this. President Obama says he doesn't listen to cable TV. He's against it. And the people at the White House say, ah, cable TV. But those cable TV sets are always on. And it's like in water... In the White House? Yes. It's like water bubbling up through the floorboards. I, or or in, in other news organizations. I mean, it may be small audiences in cable TV. You know, what's O'Reilly at the, at the high end... Two million versus, say, what was it, twenty-five million for Walter Conkright in the, in the 1960s? So, Conkright in t what, ten to one, fifteen to one? So it's a small audience, but that constant, incessant refrain from cable TV that always is on does have an impact. You can see it in the New Orleans, and excuse me, in the in the uh, Gulf spill situation. The, the the Obama people are saying we're going to ignore all this noise. But they get sucked in. I was watching Morning Joe the other day, and you could just see it happening. And Morning Joe is high end. These are very smart journalists, but they're pestering Gibbs, the White House press secretary, and then the next day I saw Axelrod. You know, why can't Obama be more emotional? Why can't he be more angry? Why can't he be more empathetic? And the White House can try to be cool, but the fact is, it, it inevitably seeps in, and they have to respond to it. And I think Hearst performed a similar function in 1898, constantly banging the drum. So McKinley would say, I don't want to listen to that yellow press, but what'd they say? Yeah, you, you say that Hearst uh, was banging the drums for war. Are you suggesting that the cable people are banging the drums for war? 
or the counterpart? Well, they certainly were uh, in, in, in 2003. Oh, my gosh, not just cable. I mean, TV loved that war. All those embedded journalists, you know, going along in their half tracks. Oh, you know, you, I mean, it was, it was uh, boys, boys with toys. It was, there was a tremendous, the Pentagon was brilliant, a brilliant strategy. I think maybe it was Tory Clark, who was a press person for uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, had this idea to embed journalists into, into units. And of course, they immediately identified and related and banded brothers and became part of the team. And, and I don't, I mean, I'm sounding cynical about it. I'm not. I would have been the same way. But what you happened? Feel then? It. What happened? Because what you're saying doesn't comport at all to what happened between the press and the war. Well, the press, I think, was pretty pro war yeah. in 2003. And then when things turned bad, the press turned against it. But only after things turned bad. I could feel it turning. I could feel it turning in Newsweek along about May, June. They're rioting in the streets of Baghdad. And we're starting to... Journalists have an amazing ability to do these screeching 180s and come around and, and attack the position that they were just defending. Journalists are just amazingly fickle and inconsistent in that way, in my experience. And journalists, before too long, were you know, going on about what a terrible war it was and how do we get into this kind of forgetting for the fact that they were cheering for the war when it was starting up. Would you say this is true of when you go back, at least in the 20th century, our wars? Sure. Uh, you know, oh, not just the 20th century. I mean, what's the cliche is people march off to war, the bands are playing, the young men are eager for combat, and then, you know, flash forward, they're dragging back missing limbs and shell-shocked, and, and the newspapers... Often, I mean, the news. This happened in the Spanish-American War as well. There was a lot of not universal. I mean, uh, you can overstate this. America. One thing I love about America is there's always an argument. There were anti-imperialists. There were people against the war. It wasn't at all 100 percent. It wasn't. There were people pushing back, but the majority of journalists were for the war. Now, once we got into the war and the army screwed up and they didn't provide the right food or they provided spoiled food and they right, didn't have the right transports and people started getting sick and there was incompetence, the press turned on, on, on the incompetent government, even as they glorified the Rough Riders and, and some of the soldiers. And then when we got caught in a wholly unanticipated counterinsurgency in the Philippines, then the press really did turn against them. I mean, what are we doing here? And it was like Vietnam. In fact... This is an interesting difference in the time. We got sucked into a counterinsurgency in the Philippines, as I said, almost by mistake. We, Teddy Roosevelt, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, sends a fleet out there to fight the Spanish. Commodore Dewey defeats Spain. The next thing you know, we're occupying the Philippines. The Filipinos do not regard us as liberators. They regard us as occupiers. So counterinsurgency breaks out. Counterinsurgencies are always grim because you don't know who's a civilian and who's a soldier. There are atrocities on both sides. For the first time, uh, the Americans borrow, they borrow a, a torture from the Spanish known as the water cure, waterboarding. I've heard that before. I've heard that before. 4,000 Americans die, same number we've lost in Iraq so far. But in 1902, after it's been dragged on, now President Roosevelt, he's been, because he's a hero, he's a rough rider, governor of New York, vice president, after McKinley is shot, president of the United States, President Roosevelt, what is he going to do? There are starting to be congressional hearings on atrocities. Sound familiar? Well, President Roosevelt just declares victory. He says, we won. War's over. No CNN in those days. There's really sort of nobody to go find out that the war's not really over. It was dragged on for, for, but he just, he was smart enough, politically astute enough, just to declare victory. We won. It's over. You make the point, and it's so interesting, that this is what happened to him in the White House. After the White House, he became as bellicose as he had been before. Well, the, one of the curious things, and Roosevelt is a very complex and interesting character. I, I should say, although I'm writing about his less appealing side, I consider him to be a great hero in, in many ways. I think he was a great president. He belongs on Mount Rushmore. I think the progressive era began really because of his force of will, busting the trusts, standing up to big business, great environmentalist, so great president. And also as president, he was not particularly bellicose. He, you know, he said, talk softly but, and carry a big stick, but he didn't use the stick. And it was as if he got something out of his system by going to war in 1898. He, he actually shot a Spaniard with a pistol, that he got something out of it. He had this need to fight, to go to war, to prove himself the greatest challenge always for a 
young man has to prove himself in war. He wasn't a young man, he was 39 years old, but he had to go. And he acquitted himself very well. He, by his own lights, he should have won the Medal of Honor. The Army was mad at him, so they refused to give it to him. But Bill Clinton gave it to yeah, him. Exactly. Uh, but Roosevelt, as president, was not bellicose. In fact, he avoided some potentially difficult situations with Germany and the Caribbean. But then, as you say, after the war, it's like the fever came back. And he was... Uh, <laughs> He goes to President Wilson and he says, I want to raise a division of men, division, to go fight against the Germans and Europe. And Wilson, no, doesn't want to make a martyr or hero out of him. As Roosevelt's leaving the White House, he says, Roosevelt says to Colonel House, who is Wilson's top aide, he says, doesn't the president understand I only want to die? And Colonel House, who's sick of Roosevelt at this point, said, oh, did you make that point quite clear to the president? <laughs> So he was a nuisance by as an old man. He was 58 years old. But of course, you know, tragically, and this is sometimes it makes me believe there really are Greek gods watching over us, Roosevelt's youngest son, all of his sons, he wants, them, he wants them to go to war to have this essential experience. They all see a lot of action. Three, I think, are wounded. Well, the youngest one, Quentin, dies, is shot down and killed. Now the war is not so romantic for Teddy Roosevelt. And he sits there in his library muttering his son's name, Quinty, Quinty, and he's dead within six months himself. And we know that uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the son, did acquit himself as yes. a hero. Yes. I mean, this is fascinating that Teddy Roosevelt Jr. was having a nervous breakdown as an 11-year-old when dad went off to war, I think, because imagine being Teddy Roosevelt Jr., you know, the pressure that must have been on him. Uh, and Teddy was senior, was always talking about war, and you have to be a little soldier and all this. Well, Teddy Jr. actually becomes a general officer in World War II, is the only general officer who lands at D-Day, routes a German position using a cane, leading an attack, and wins the Medal of Honor, the medal that his father had never won. Fascinating history that you've written. Stay with me. I want to talk not just about war and history, but about history and journalism for another program, okay? You bet. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time as well. And meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at www.theopenmind.tv. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.